Thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Xiao Bo and I'm working for Synthet Materials and Chemistry. And uh, Professor Odmog Access is my colleague and also Professor Zhiliang Zhang. Since we are from Norway today, uh, we are, I'm going to talk about material challenges for cold climate. I, I will uh, tell you how cold it is not. Um, it's not like Catania uh, every day is more than 20, 20 degrees. Uh, we do have many, uh, many materials in our projects, but today I will talk about safety criteria for steels. And uh, it's not very uh, scientific details, but instead of instead I'm going to talk about the project itself and the, the aspects we want to cover for this project and uh, some, some topics related to safety criteria. And the why Arctic? We are talking about Arctic region since Norway is so close to our Arctic area because it's a, uh, it's a huge interest for oil and gas industry. It's reported the Arctic seabed may hold as much as 30% of the world's undiscovered uh, gas and 13% of the, the world's undiscovered uh, oil. So of course it's a huge interest for uh, go there. Uh, as it indicated, it's covered by snow, by ice every whole year. So it's a, it's a huge challenge for uh, oil industries to go there to, get, to have any activities. Uh, here's a picture, it's a typical picture of, uh, you know, it's a uh, structure and covered with ice, a lot of uh, uh, challenges here. It's a harsh environment, <coughs> low temperature, large offshore wind, and also straw mats. And the ice ice bird, six months, month, uh, month is a darkness. Uh, basically, little or no infrastructure, so meaning it's very difficult for maintenance. And a very strict uh, environmental requirement, so basically no leakage is allowed and no spare oil spare and uh, maintenance is free. So we, uh, we indeed we need very robust uh, material solutions. Here's the temperature. Uh, uh, this is uh, the lowest ambient temperature on the Norwegian continental shelf at the moment. It's something like minus 20 degrees and this picture shows it's a new, it's just a uh, newly operated uh, oil uh, platform, it's called it, uh, uh, Goliath. In this area, the temperature is minus 20, but we have to uh, expect in the Arctic regions, minimum ambient temperature well below minus 40 should be, uh, must be expected. And consequently, minimum, minimum design temperature of materials can be down to minus 60. So this is also our project is aiming for the test of materials, most of materials at minus, minus 60 degrees or even minus 90 degrees. Uh, as, as you may know, the typical problem for steel for, for low temperature is that if we cool down our steel from high temperature to low temperature, it's ductile to brittle transition will happen. Okay? So if we look at this, if the temperature area here is uh, Arctic area and you, you build up your plant home or any structures with a sort, of, sort of a ductile material and if material, temperature cool down, it will, be, it will have, have some uh, brittle fracture and this is the issue we have to avoid. And by the way, if we have, even we have very good base material, no matter what sort of steel you can produce after welding, it can be detrimental. It may shift the uh, transition temperature to higher temperature, or maybe the weldability itself is the issue. So the temperature really matters here. Uh, so challenges for industry, why they are inter so interested to do this research on material acceptance criteria, in the Arctic, there will be no long time frame uh, for arriving at a safe and robust criterion based on available experience. It's actually in Norsok, and that is a standard machine that uh, was used by uh, offshore industry in Norway, Norsok. Uh, standard is a cover to design temperature down to minus 14. Uh, actually, from minus 14 down to minus 16, this is sort of a gap. With, uh, there's no uh, guideline or standard to follow. So our project is basically want to cover this uh, this gap. Uh, so we, we call this must develop some knowledge base criteria to be applied from day one if you want to go there for any activities. And having a search criteria will be high importance in order to obtain sort of a license to operate because if we don't have an understanding of our materials, they are not allowed to go there to have any activity. So. Uh, based on this background, we started a uh, project from 2000, uh, 2008 
that the first stake uh, until 2012. Focus on materials, steel, polymer, composites, and some coatings. <coughs> and the second stake from 2013 to uh, next year. This time we add aluminum into this, uh, into this picture. Uh, steel is also focused and also polymer. And here is a really big uh, consortium from uh, the whole value chain of uh, uh, from uh, material producers, engineering companies, and the users, and also research institutes, plus DMAGL, who is going to publish a design guideline. So this is a very, very nice uh, consortium. Okay, the ob objective of this project is to develop robust and cost-effective materials and solutions for use in Arctic area. Uh, material characterization. We did a lot of work to, to test different materials from different suppliers at different temperatures, and we developed other ones, the material models, to try to predict and understand why it fails uh, these issues. And in the end, we, we tried to centralize all of our research into a uh, material design guideline. This will be used for our uh, end users and engineering companies. So I'm uh, just talk about a little bit design philosophy. What is uh, how we design a, a structure in Arctic area, <coughs> following different approaches. Uh, here's an increasing the versatility, increasing complexity. Of course, the best is that if we have a material that is decked out, at a, a decked out material approach, is the material filling boat should be under uh, all uh, circumstances be decked out. Uh, typically, if the CTU divided could be minus, uh, could be 0.5 millimeter, even for minus 16. This is going to be really uh, costly. Uh, then we have another approach, the second one, the plast uh, plastic collapse approach. The combination between the uh, fracture toughness and defect size must be that the, uh, the plastic collapse is not likely to be affected by brittle fracture. Uh, using this criteria, the CTO divider can be typically between 0.25 to 0.5 millimeter, but still uh, we think this could be quite expensive. So we have a proposed a new design philosophy so called a fracture resistant approach. We use so called a fracture mechanics into design of uh, offshore structure. So we have to develop a criteria use a combination of a fracture toughness and loading and also practice. Uh, applied load and a defect size, uh, that should lead to a uh, acceptably low probability of a brittle fracture. So simply, uh, to, to make this simple, is that actually we should admit brittle fracture can happen or locally for some material, but the whole structure should be sort of ducked up. By using this way, we sort of reduce the uh, safety requirement of our material, that, that will be cheaper solutions. Uh, so in order to uh, achieve a really robust acceptance criteria, we have to touch many issues. So I'm going to point out some important issues. And it's not not scientific, uh, not <coughs> concluded myself, but as I point out the challenges. Uh, we are really welcome all of you if you are interested in this area. Let's have some collaboration and discussion. The first thing is the toughness is scatter. I'm talking about you know, the brittle fracture. If you test your material at minus 60 uh, degrees, you're going to have a lot of scatter of your uh, fracture toughness data. So the question is how to determine a, 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 a characteristic CTO value. In the end, the designers need one value to tell me what is the value we, we have to use. So this is uh, if you test uh, one series of specimen, uh, get 20 points, what is, what is the value you can use? This is a question from uh, directly from our designers. And the second one, in order to, to understand why this gap is here, we, we do a lot of uh, uh, testing and also simulations and uh, try to understand what's the microstructure and the link between microstructure and the feeling mechanisms. Uh, so we propose this initiation control mechanisms or propagation control mechanisms by using acoustic emission. Try to listen to material if your material broke at, uh, at minus 60, or the sort of uh, uh, acoustic emission signals can can be uh, detected, and indeed we can sort of roughly link this uh, CTU value with different microstructures. Uh, 
and also the residual stresses have been welded in these residual stresses that is an important issue. Uh, the question here is how to quantify, quantify the effect of residual stresses. Uh, we don't know, basically it's very hard to measure residual stresses and it's very hard to, to really to, to tell how much, is, uh, how much of these residual stresses can affect uh, structure uh, integrity. So here is in structure integrity assessment we often assume a really conservative value. The residual stress can be up to yield the stress that is very conservative. How can we re reduce the conservatism? And also the how residual stress may affect the transition, uh, ductile to breathe the transition. This will be a, a talk on Friday by one of our future students. You are welcome to join us. <coughs> And next issue is uh, tensile properties. If you test your material uh, from room temperature to low temperature, this is typical curves you will really get. Uh, with decrease of temperature, the yield stress will increase, and also one very special issue is about the Lewis bond. You will, you will have an increase in Lewis bond for your material properties. And how we understand that such material properties, the properties are crack driving force is an important issue. And recently we proposed a model uh, Try to understand this using using proper model. You can uh, simply uh, predict the crack drawing force using the data from uh, testing. Uh, and this is uh, our first version of proposed acceptance criterion from our first stage of project. Uh, we divide if it is a typical uh, crack drawing force uh, in this years of applied load and the required CQD value. We sort of uh, divide this curve into two class, class one and two. Class one is up to utilization, uh, up to 80% of yield stress. And for case where the following requirement of math is depth. Uh, defect depth is uh, smaller than five millimeter. Defect length is, uh, is some, uh, smaller than five, 1.5 times of uh, uh, realistic height is this one. And the effective uh, utilization is up to 80% of yield stress. So if uh, these these requirements are met, uh, you have we can use these criteria to design. Of course, we also introduce these constraint parameters as uh, we mentioned. We tested, for instance, SENT, SENB with different crack size, how we correct, uh, correlate the different geometries with uh, with toughness. And if it's a class two in this area, it's a critical. Uh, then we, we recommend the uh, ECA engineering critical assessment should be performed. And this is uh, so far the most important, I pointed out some important issues we, uh, we think is to, uh, important to cover. And uh, this, I will conclude my talk with uh, some key words uh, in microstructure, fracture mechanisms, toughness, scatter, constraint and correction, and the crack arrest, weld metal, and also the thickness effect, residual stresses, stress strain behavior. Well, the thermal simulation to simulate microstructures and models. Numerical models are simplified, empirical or analytical models are important. And how we really refine our design classes. Uh, and uh, if anyone is interested in such, such topics, just contact me. Uh, thank you for your attention. If you like, you can use your small tablet to scan the code. I'm here. Thank you.